you would, grab your Bibles and open up to the epistle of 3 John. It's not a gospel, it's not a necessarily a historical or a prophetic book, it's more of a personal letter that John wrote to a dear friend. And John, if you're unfamiliar with that name, he was the guy that just uh, shared a few moments ago, but not that John. We're, we're talking about John the Apostle, John the Disciple, John the follower after Jesus, John who's known as the one whom Jesus loved, and John the one who is known as the Apostle of love. Now, quick introductory question just so we can get to know one another a little bit better. How many of you guys have actually maybe read or heard or listened to it, read the book of 3 John before? How many of you kind of leafed your way through it? Good. Some people are honest, like, I never read that. Well, cool. Won't be able to say that after next Sunday, if you come back next Sunday. But here's the cool thing about 3 John. It's actually the shortest book in the original language in the New Testament. It's not very long. And in fact, today we're not even going to cover the whole deal. We're just going to cover the first eight verses of 3 John. And I'm going to be reading and teaching this morning out of a translation that's known as the New Living Translation. Not the New World Translation. Don't read that one. That's not a good one. But the New Living Translation. Read that one. The New Living Translation is a thought-for-thought thought translation from the original language, which was Greek, Koine Greek, Common Greek, into the English language. You say, what is thought-for-thought? Thought? Help me understand that. Well, you know how you have apps that translate for you, and you can go, okay. A lot of times those are word-for-word. Word. Sometimes they're thought-for-thought, thought, depending on the language from which you're trans translating from and to. When you have a thought-for-thought, the thought is, I want you to understand the voice behind what's being said. Not necessarily just get the verba, but the vox. These are translation terms, if you're familiar with them. The vox means you catch the heartbeat. You, you can almost like hear the tone of what the author was hoping to express. Now, in Bible translations, there are verba translations and Vox translations. Say, so this is too much, Neil. It's 11.35 on a Sunday. The students are in here. They've already tuned you out. Hey, man, I've got a student. You know, I understand that. She's 11. She tunes me out. No, just teasing. But anyway, um, Verba, New King James, New American Standard, good, solid Verba translations. New Living Translation, kind of the NIV, a little bit more thought for thought. Here's my opinion. Read both. Read both. If you were to ask, well, which ones do you read? I'm not going to tell you, but you might pick up on this one that I read from this one, like the New Living Translation. And that's where we'll be this morning. 3 John verses 1 through 8 from the New Living Translation. And here's our title for this morning. Let's get healthy. Let's get healthy. I think with COVID culture surrounding us, most people would go, yes and amen to that. Like, let's get healthy. Well, this morning, we're actually in a three, well, part three of a four-part series. We're, we're navigating our way through 2nd and 3rd John with this theme centered upon truth, love, and obedience. Last Sunday, Pastor John, the guy that was just up here speaking, who's 40, that's, that's what he said, um, he said a statement that I thought was so, so well put. He said, you know, truth and love need to hold hands. They're not enemies. They're friends. Truth and love. Now, this is where we may disagree. And I'm okay, I'm ready to disagree. No. But what is truth? Ooh, that's a good question. Who gets to define it? A philosophy teacher with a PhD? You, because you have a strong social media platform? Who gets to define truth? Here's what I think. Whoever creates it gets to define it. Well, who created truth? Not you. And not some PhD and not me. So who gets to define it? The author of the laws of logic gets to define truth. The one who gave us what is called in the original language, 
Theopneustos. Well, what the heck is that? God breathed scripture, inspired. He's the one who gets to define truth. You have no business defining it. And neither do I. Neither does a person who sings into a microphone or pretends on a screen. Who cares what they think? They're made of the same 13 elements of dirt that you and I are. They're just like us. So who gets to define truth? Well, here's what Martin Luther once said, if you have any respect for him. He said, upon reason and scripture, I stand. This was at the Council of Worms. Why is that important? Because he was in an inquisition, and religious leaders were attacking him, and they weren't being reasonable. They weren't listening to scripture. So this is basically what he said by that statement, upon scripture and reason, I stand. If we can't connect on basic logic and we can't connect on scripture, let me have your attention, let me see your eyes, then we can't connect. If you're going to be unreasonable and unbiblical, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you, right? Like that's that statement, right? Like that's what, that's what he said. If we can't connect on reason and scripture, then we cannot connect. So what does that mean? You're hardwired with logic. You are. You may seek to fight it, but you can't fight hardwiring. Well, then what is truth? This is how I was trained to define truth. I believe it's both reasonable and scriptural. It, it works in real life, and it works in this book. Truth is absolute and knowable. It is not relative to your situation, circumstance, personality, upbringing, and dynamics. Truth is absolute and knowable. Secondarily, truth is that which corresponds coherently to reality. Now, that is a lot to chew on, and we will not bite into it today. But that's our baseline. Truth, what is it? It's that which is knowable, that which is absolute, and that which corresponds to reality. Hot tea is in this cup because my throat is sore. That is a true statement. Therefore, I shall drink the tea to soothe the sore throat. This is an action. Because I believe in truth, I experience benefit and blessing and the fruit of truth. And here's the deal. Truth and love should always shake hands. Well, what is love? Last week, Pastor John read 1 Corinthians 13 from the J.D. Phillips translation. Let me read it to you. I think he does such a good job. Let me read 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4, to help understand what love is. This love of which I speak, the Apostle Paul writes, slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. It's not possessive. It's neither anxious to impress, nor does it cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. Love has good manners. That's the biggest lesson right now for Uliam Lee Neal Spencer. Liam, my, my five-year-old. Good manners, bro. <laughs> like, oh, anyway. Love has good manners and does not pursue selfish advantage. It's not touchy. Ooh, is that our current culture? It does not keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. When you see someone fall, you don't, you don't, you don't get stoked on that. It, it saddens you. On the contrary, it's glad with all good men when truth prevails. Love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It cannot last anything. In fact, it is the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. Some people think that teaching through the Bible expositionally, just going through it and explaining it, observing it, interpreting it, and applying it, has lost its day. I, <laughs> I saw an interview with a cultural influencer who said this, man, I'm in the entertainment business and sauces it on everything, I don't need more sauce on my scripture. He said, just give me the Bible. 
says, ooh, that was good. We just need to know the Bible. We don't gather to be entertained. We don't gather to have our ears tickled by fish stories, even though fish stories are wonderful. We don't gather to, to kind of receive a spiritual good from this dispenser. We gather to sing Jesus. We gather to learn about Jesus. We gather to serve Jesus by serving others. We gather to give to Jesus by giving to our local fellowship. We gather on a Sunday morning because that was the day that death was defeated. Sunday should make you stoked. Why? Because on a Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. So on a Sunday, you should get out of bed and gather together with Jesus' people to worship a resurrected Savior. See, here's the deal about a Sunday morning. It's not about me, and it's not about you. The music isn't designed to entertain and connect with you as much as it is designed and to glorify God. Now, we benefit from it, but this service is all about the number one customer. And the number one customer is God. That's why it's called a worship gathering, not a me gathering, right? Like, like it's about him. And here's the best thing about coming to church. Doesn't it seem like everything else in life, people are trying to make it about you? Social media, get them to follow you. Come to this place and you're, you're right, right? You're the customer. So if your Starbucks drink isn't right, we'll make it right. Sometimes they do that. They used to do that 10 years ago. Sometimes I don't anymore. Anyway, wait. But it's, it's, it can be a little exhausting to make life all about you. But when you come to a place, you're like, okay, wait a second. It's not about me. Like if I have hair, I can kind of let it down. Like I can kind of put my shoulders back a little bit. And, and this is about God. I can worship him. That's why I'm here. I can learn about him. My kids can learn about him. My students, we together. Yes. Yes. Life is about falling in love with God, the one who's created you. Now listen, second and third John, they really hinge upon the pillars of faith and practice. Well, what is that? Truth, love, and obedience. That's what these books are all about. And walking out the truth in love is evidenced through obedience. Jesus said, you love me when you obey my commandments. That's how you show your love for me. Not through like, like really good lyrics. Even though that's a good way. With a really good tune. Now that's, that's helpful. But when you say, you know what? If I'm single, then I choose celibacy until marriage. Ah, now you love God. You know with my money, I'm going to see it as a steward, not an owner. Ah, now you love God. You know, with my time, I'm going to serve others and not serve myself. Now you love God. You're stepping into a loving relationship with God through obedience because you need to earn his favor? No, because you already have it. Here's the good news about Jesus. You don't earn a right standing with God. It's a free gift. God gives you his righteousness through his son, Jesus. And life is lived in love with him because you're forgiven. Not, not to earn forgiveness, but because you've been forgiven. See, and here's the deal that was going on in the culture that John was writing to. There were apostates. There were false teachings. There were these preachers to culture that were saying, no, it's this way. Truth is, is relative. Just do whatever you want. No, love is about living for yourself. Can I ask you a question? Can I see your eyes? May I have your attention? Are those voices still loud in this culture? Some people agree. Jerry and Linda do. Thank you, Jerry and Linda. Yeah, well, that's the culture run. Yeah. yeah. You live in the same kind of world that the first century Christians lived in. So in the 21st century, living the truth in love by obedience, man, it still speaks volumes. Here's the deal. Let me read this to you because I didn't artfully and accurately. We are called to love everyone. 
We cannot choose to love just those who look and act like us. We must love those who disagree with us. This does not mean we compromise our beliefs or confuse others with our actions. But somehow, our culture has equated loving with approving. At times, the most loving thing we can do is lovingly disagree, and this is the tightrope of our day. We must daily choose to live with a sensitive awareness of other people. And what I would add to that is this. We must live with a daily awareness that truth and love are not enemies, but they work best when they're holding hands. So here comes the question. How do we do that? Like, like how do we live in truth with love obediently? I don't know about you, but I, I work best with examples or somebody that's doing it and I can just kind of maybe do what they're doing. That's the best way I know how to learn something. It's like, oh, you know how to change a tire? Well, I'm going to YouTube that and watch how you do it, right? Oh, you know how to like clean a surfboard? I don't know how to do that. Either I'm going to watch you in person or I'm going to watch you online. And if I can watch you online, I can rewind you a bunch of times and watch you over again, right? Example, story is the best way sometimes to learn. Well, here's the thing this morning. We're going to engage with a guy's story. His name is Gaius. He's the individual that 3 John is written to. And the apostle of love, John, he writes to him and says, listen, you are a disciple that I dearly adore. And I want to speak about you a little bit. So in verses 1 through 8 this morning, we're going to learn a little bit, catch a glimpse into the life of this man, Gaius. Let me read verses 1 through 4 from 3 John, again, from the New Living Translation. I'll pray, and then we're going to share a few elements of his example, dynamics of his story that we can learn and glean from, and how we can live the truth in love by walking obediently for God's glory and our joy. Verse 1 of 3 John reads like this. This letter is from John, the elder. I'm writing to Gaius, my dear friend, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Now, some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you're living according to the truth. I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. Father, in humility this morning, we ask that by your spirit, you'd speak to us through your word. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. John, no doubt, cares for this guy named Gaius. Now, here's the deal about him. Verse four might suggest that this individual was actually someone that John led to the Lord. He kind of gives this indication by saying, listen, I have no greater joy than seeing my my children walk in, in the ways of God. It's possible that John was the guy to kind of maybe pray the sinner's prayer with Gaius or point him to Jesus. But also, if you've ever read 1 John chapter 2, well, John actually kind of identifies most believers this way, little children. So whether or not Gaius was an original disciple of John or or not, the the big point to take away is that he's a disciple of Jesus. And, And here's the deal. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. No matter who your pastor is, who you ultimately follow is Jesus. He is the chief shepherd. He is the senior leader of the capital C church. And that's who you are going after. He's the one you're following. And that's what Gaius did. Now, here's the deal about Gaius. He's an example to follow. Because I'm, uh, I guess because I'm me, I like alliteration. I've got five kids, Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, and Leo. So in this little message, I'm going to have three words that don't begin with L, because I'm running out of L's, right? But like that are going to begin with the letter S. So here they are. We see that Gaius is an example to follow because he has a healthy spirit. The first point for this morning, the first way to learn from the life of Gaius 
is that he has a healthy spirit. Look with me again, if you would, at verse 2. John writes, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. See, John may, may not, be hinting here that Gaius has an issue, right? That there's something going on with him physically that he's not up to par. You know, a generation ago, there was this strong teaching from faith healers that if you truly had faith in God, you would experience no physical ailment. And then if you did experience some sort of lack in your body, it was dynamically connected to your faith in God, the healer. However, if you read 3 John verse 2, it pretty much says, eh, wrong, right? Like it kind of says, well, listen, here's this guy Gaius who's strong in spirit, but he's struggling physically. See, it's possible to be spiritually healthy and physically sick. Physical health, it's a result of nutrition, exercise, cleanliness, proper rest, the disciplined order of a balanced life. And spiritual health is very similar. See, we must nourish ourselves with a steady diet of God's word. Now, let me share something with you about the 21st century. There is a vast difference in teaching the Bible and a teaching from the Bible. Those are two different things. You need to be under the constant and consistent, steady teaching of God's word, where you're taking it in and it's being taught to where you can understand it and live it. This is our nourishment. And we work out that nourishment in godly exercise. We'll say, what do you mean by that? You exercise through serving, through serving. When you rode down um, Oriole Beach Road today, did you see that new frame that's going up over Horizons? That used to look like a barn, and it was called Barn Hills. Pretty, pretty apropos, right? And it was a buffet. And I remember when it closed, because my brother and I and our family, sometimes we'd go there after church. And it was just kind of like this, you know, not every Sunday, but every once in a while. It had kind of every food imaginable, like you'd get ice cream and sushi and like, you know, chicken and whatever. It was all there. And then when it closed, my brother goes, oh, the dream is dead. Barn Hills is gone. Like it was just this place, you know, that like you would always go to. And it was fun. And it was shaped like a barn. But it's a buffet, right? Buffet. You go there and you just kind of you don't do intermittent fasting at a buffet, right? Anybody say, like, that's not what you do. You go there and you eat. It's not a time to fast, it's a time to feast, right? That's, that's what you do at the buffet. Well, here's the deal. Like to be spiritually healthy, if you're just buffeting it all the time, right? Like I'm just here to eat that sermon today at church. Wait a second. That's like one of the 10 things we're supposed to be doing when we gather. It's not the only thing we do, sit and receive a sermon, like, if you just do that at church, you know what you're going to become? Like, lethargic. Like, groggy. Like, you're not serving. No wonder there's no sharpness in your spirit. No wonder things go over your head spiritually. Because you're not engaged spiritually in the way that you should be to be spiritually fit. You're doing what Billy Graham said is a no-no. Billy Graham said the dangerous, most dangerous thing for an American to do is to listen to a sermon. Well, that doesn't make any sense from Billy Graham. Here's what he means. Sermons are designed for learning and living. And if you just get the learning down, you're missing it. Can you imagine what would happen in America if Christians were Christ-like? Can you imagine? If we no longer pursued salary, status, sex, substance, situation, and stuff, and started living for a savior, I think America might be great again. Maybe we're looking to another to do the job that we're designed to do. But this is not our home. 
our country is heavenward. And you become the best citizen of your physical country when you realize that you're first and foremost a citizen of that country. And that the kingdom that you live for has a king that's not elected. Like he, he, he like earned that throne. How? The Bible says God gave him that place to sit down. See, when you serve the king and you recognize that you're a king's kid, I think you're a better American, a better Nigerian, a better, is, is it Japan, J- Japanese, China, however that is, I never lived there. But like, whoever you are, wherever you are, when you first understand this, I need to get this right, then this becomes right. But so many of us are trying to fix this without this being right. No wonder it's wrong. You must always get the vertical before the horizontal in your marriage, in your money, in your ministry, in your marketplace. It's about God. For so long, I've heard people say, well, this is business. No. Everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. What you eat, what you think, where you play, where you spend, it all determines what you ascribe worth to. And that's what worthship is. That's the root, that's the etymology of the word. You're ascribing worth to something through what you worship. It's not a genre on your playlist, it's every attitude, it's every action, it's every choice, it's every belief. You're describing worth to something. Here's what I'm trying to say spiritual fitness. happens as we nourish ourselves in God's word, as we serve, as we do as 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, and keep our lives clean, as we avoid the contamination of the world, like 2 Peter 1, 4 says, as we rest and gain strength in fellowship with Jesus, like Matthew chapter 11, verse 18 says, come away, rest, all you who labor, Did you know that you will not find the kind of rest your soul longs for in a staycation or a vacation? You know where you're going to find it? At the foot of the cross. It's where your soul finds rest. And some of you may not know what I'm talking about. But some of you do. And you're spiritually tired. Physically, you're fine. Emotionally, you're not, you're not depressed, you're good. But spiritually, you're tapped out. You need to rest. You need to recognize this very simple but powerful truth that you can be still and recognize that he is God. That the election doesn't catch him by surprise. That your health issue is on his radar. That your financial worries first passed his desk before it fell onto yours. That everything in life is father filtered. And anxiety is not of him. So if something is causing you to be anxious, you must ask yourself, am I engaging in that which is godly? Because I can rest in him. And does that mean that we're human and we get anxious? Yes. I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm talking about realignment and balance. That when you recognize, man, I'm getting worked up on this, go, wait a second. Am I keeping a biblical mindset? That's part of spiritual fitness. See, Gaius was that guy. Spiritually, he was fit. But here's the second S. It's in verses three through four. Not only did he have a healthy spirit, but here's the deal. Gaius had healthy status. Status. You say, what do you mean by that? Look at verses three and four. Verse three of 3 John. If you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus is Lord. Okay, if you believe that in your heart, you just confess it with your mouth, you're saved. That's awesome. Verses three and four. Verse three, he says, some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you're living according to the truth. He says, man, I could have no greater joy than to hear that my kids are following the truth. Here's the deal. His reputation was healthy. His status was this. Man, that guy Gaius, he obeys the word, he walks in truth, and he's hospitable. Some believers made visits to John and they spoke well of him. 
Well, what made his testimony, his status, his reputation so good? I like what Warren Wearsby says. Let me put it up on the screen for you real quick. Here's what W.W. says. He says, Gaius read the word, meditated on it, delighted in it, and then practiced it in his daily life. Kind of like what Psalms 1 talks about. What digestion is to the body, meditation is to the soul. It's not enough to merely hear the word or read the word. We must inwardly digest it and make it a part of our inner person. Gaius was a guy just like me, just like you, just like a normal person, just someone from somewhere, like all of us, right? Everyone is from somewhere, right? Just someone from somewhere who came to know Jesus and said, okay, well, I just want to serve him. So here's what God's given me. I've got a home that people can stay in, or I've got a little bit of money to help these traveling teachers. I'm going to help them. You can do that. You can serve God in your giftings, talents, and abilities. That's what Gaius did. You know what it earned him? A healthy status. Gaius was an example of health. He had a healthy spirit. Now, this is where the like, rubber hits the road, right? This is where the metal of the word hits the meat of the flesh. Here it is. Gaius was an example of health. His spirit was healthy. Is yours. How is your soul? Let me share with you on the screen a, a post of an individual who at one time served in the North eastern corridor of our country as a very well-known pastor, a pastor who had great influence with those of affluence, if I can say that. And over the last few weeks, there's been this dynamic that's come to light that, as he termed it, he, he was not healthy in his spirit, that he had neglected that. That he had tremendous, I mean, I think he has tremendous talent and capability and connections and, man, very gifted, extremely gifted. But he recognized something. I neglected my own spirit. And out of that, I made really bad choices. That resonated with me as I read about Gaius because that's not how Gaius's, like, spirit was. And therefore, his status didn't have to update to this. Gaius said, listen, man, I'm going to keep my walk with the Lord daily. I'm not going to drift. See, life with the Lord is about a daily relationship. Don't tell me about what God did yesterday. Tell me what he's doing right now. Right now. Don't tell me about tomorrow. Don't tell me about yesterday. Tell me about now. Because you know what? Today is your twilight. Say, what do you mean? Nobody is promised tomorrow. How is your spirit? Are you finding your rest in him? See, here's the reality. You have to ask yourself this question. Am I balancing spiritual nutrition, exercise, cleanliness, proper rest, and the disciplined order of a balanced spiritual life. Ask yourself this question. Am I going it alone? Or am I part of a team? And do I have a trainer? Do I even see value in that? What could I do differently today to pursue balance? Because here's the reality. Spiritual health is not a problem to solve. It's a tension to balance. Salvation is a problem to solve. And you can't solve it. There's one guy. His name's Jesus. He solved that problem. But then for the rest of our lives, you know what we do? Out of a platform of already being forgiven, out of a standing with God where we're set free after relationally being brought into a family and given a destiny with a future, we fall in love with Jesus. Are you spiritually fit? Can I be honest with you? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm a part of all. Is anyone else here a part of all? A couple of you guys are. Here's the deal. If you listen to this message and go, oh no, I gotta start doing this and doing this and do, 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 do. You're doing do, do. You know what I mean? Like you're doing stinky religious work. If you you hear this and go, I gotta do, do. I gotta do, do. No, no, no. 
There's someone who's called it done. And his name is Jesus. When he hung upon that cross, he said, to die. it's finished. The problem's solved. God paid the debt through the gift of his son, Jesus. And all you have to do is trust that that finished work on the cross and his resurrection covers you. And here's the deal. You're good, man. Your problem is solved. But here's the deal. I'm asking you a different question. How's your spiritual health? You say, well, my problem is solved. I know it is, man. But here's the deal. Spiritual health after birth is just like physical birth. You say, what do you mean? You don't like solve physical health, right? Like I've solved it. I don't have to eat anymore. I can just walk around. I'm good to go. I don't have to put anything under here, anything here. I don't have to do anything with this up here. I've solved it all. No, 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 no. I need to wash this, right? I need to clean this. If you have this, take care of it. I don't really have much, but what I have, I try to take care of. You balance it. Anyone ever uh, ridden in a car? Oh, come on, man. We don't have no taxis here. You rode here today. That car has to be balanced, like literally. Like if it's not, in, you're going to know. The engine needs maintenance. Anyone ever seen a tree? Look to your left, look to your right. Real quick, you can see it. You have to trim those things. You have to water them. They have to be in good soil. They don't just like stay like that. You may, you may think this campus stays clean. Like there's like these little angels that just come down. No, there's like these people here like Jimmy who works super hard to make sure when you come here, it's clean. Let's all give Jimmy a round of applause. Like, yeah. But no, what I'm trying to say is this, like moms, you know this. You know this. Like a house, it needs some balancing, Right? No moms know that. It needs maintenance. Dads know that. Like, everything in life is not always a problem to solve. Sometimes it's a tension to balance. And if you don't put that lens on, you might have to do a status update one day. And I don't want that for you. I want you to do well in your marriage. I want you to do well in the marketplace. I want you to do well in ministry. I want you to do well in parenting. And I'm saying to you this, spiritual health must be a priority. You must be in God's word. You must be in community. And you must live your daily lives on mission. If you don't do those three things, you're at least one degree off. If you don't value daily living as a sacrifice to Jesus, like Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, if you don't value community like Acts chapter 2, verse 40 through 47 says, if you don't value worship gatherings, you're off, man. You're off. And that one degree over time, you're going to be way off. Stop church hopping. Find one and plug in. No church is perfect. You're married, stick with that marriage partner. No marriage partner is perfect. You got kids, you can't divorce them. You got to keep them, man. Like, like parent them well. Life's not about finding the sweet spot. It's about making your spot sweet. That's what it's about. This guy right here, he said, my spirit's going to be healthy. Second thing he said is this. I recognize that a status isn't for sale. I got to earn it. I don't care who you are, man. I don't care how much money you have how many contacts you have, you can't buy your reputation. You have to earn it. And here's the deal. When people hear your name, what comes to mind? Lazy? Know-it-all? Listen, you'd rather be a learn-it-all than a know-it-all in life. What comes to mind? Aggro? That guy's just always fighting. Like, what comes to mind when people hear your name? Your status, your reputation, your testimony is worth more than what's in your portfolio or financial accounts, what's parked in your garage, what address you pull up to. And your status is not for sale. You can only earn it. And you earn it daily with a lifestyle of truth, love, and obedience. Now, let's close this down because I I don't want to take too much more of your time. But let's learn a little bit more. We've learned about two S's of Gaius. 
Let's learn more from this fashionista of fitness, right? Look at verses 5 through 8 of 3 John. If you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus is amazing. That's great. Dear friends, you are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through, even if they're strangers to you. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. For they're traveling for the Lord. And they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. The third and final S of today is this. Gaius was an example of health in his view and attachment to stuff. Stuff. His spirit was healthy. His status was healthy. And he had a healthy view of stuff. See, listen. In practical ways, he served those who were serving by teaching the word. See, listen, we don't have a clue who Gaius was. He could have been a dad who had babies that cried. That's who Gaius could have been. We don't know anything about him. Gaius, he could have had like all these talents and abilities and callings and money and houses. We had no, he could have been a guy that had a shack and a cot. We don't know nothing about him. But here's what we do know. He was an encouragement. When strangers showed up to his door, he said, I got a cot for you. I got a bowl of soup. You can have mine. He was hospitable. That's a lost art in the 21st century. We're so afraid of each other that if we meet a stranger, it's always stranger danger. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I got five kids. I'm all about stranger danger. But sometimes you can take that a little too far where it excuses just good old-fashioned hospitality. It's okay to talk to people. You know, take that in context. I know we're in 21st century. 21st century is crazy. But... I'm just trying to say, don't forsake hospitality. That's all I'm really trying to say. He opened his heart and his hand to give, here's the deal. Remember, you're not supposed to talk about this in church. Money. He gave his money to ministry. I'm going to be honest with you. That's an awkward thing for me to talk about because I'm in ministry, as are you. Everyone's in ministry. But I'm in like this like unique kind of ministry where you're like, you work at the church. But here's what John does. He gives four motivational, four mandates from Scripture of why you should give your money to ministry. You go, oh no, here it comes. I knew this. Was my first day at church. I knew they were going to talk about money. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to talk about it. You're all right. Let's get out of here. Here's what I am going to do. I'm going to let a guy who I greatly respect who I wish I would have gotten to know personally. He wrote 170 books. Brilliant guy. Went to meet Jesus just last year. His name is Warren Wearsby. Great author. If you can pick up one of his 170 books, I'd highly recommend it. But he gave us, in this little commentary on 3 John, four reasons why we should live this way with our money. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to read what Warren said. You know why? Because he's in heaven. You can't get mad at him. He's already up there, man. So like, don't take it out on me. I'm just reading Warren Wearsby, right? But here's what he says. Why should we live this way where we give money to ministry? I can't tell people are fidgeting. Cans are falling over. Like, people are like, oh, money, here it comes. Like, hey, man, money's where your heart is. Okay, here we go. Why should we live this way with our money? Verse 6 says, because it honors God. Look at what it says in verse 6. He said, they've told the church here of your loving friendship, please continue providing for such teachers. Why? In a manner that pleases God. Here's what Warren says. We are never more godlike than when we are sacrificing to serve others. He quotes Colossians 1, and it from the old King Jimmy, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. He says, since these itinerant ministers were representing the name of the Lord, any ministry to them was really a service to Jesus Christ. A sacrifice is not a sacrifice unless it's a sacrifice. Second reason, it was a witness to the lost. Verse 7, look at it. It says, they're traveling, but they don't accept anything from people who aren't believers. Listen to what Warren says. When God's people 
adequately support God's servants, it is a powerful testimony to the loss. But when ministers or churches and other religious organizations go about soliciting from unsaved people in various businesses, it makes Christianity look cheap and commercial. This does not mean God's servants should refuse a voluntary gift from an unconverted person, as long as the person understands that the gift will not purchase salvation. Even then, we must be very cautious. I think that's good advice. Number three, why should we give our money to ministry? He says because of verse eight, it's obedience. Look at verse eight, the first part. He said, so we ourselves should support them, meaning this is what you do. He says this, this ministry of hospitality and support is not only an opportunity, but an obligation. Galatians 6 makes it clear that those who receive spiritual blessings from the minister of the word ought to share with him in material blessings. 1 Corinthians 9 further explains this principle, and he gives a story. He says, as a deacon expressed it to me in the first church I pastored, you pay your board where you get your food. It is unbiblical for church all over the world and neglect. Do you know that Gulf Breeze is our first mission field? Like we love El Salvador, but we don't live there. And so let's send some people over there and help them. But what about, we got to help here too. There's, did you know there's people in Gulf Breeze that don't know Jesus? What are you doing about that? What are we doing about that? Maybe we should do something about that. We already have. We planted a church. Like this is part of it. You're part of the process. You're on the team. You're doing the right thing. Okay, anyway. Last, fourth, and finally, partnership. Look at the last half of part of uh, verse eight where he says, so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. I like this one. I, I like what he says here. We do not know what his spiritual gifts were or how he served in the congregation, but we do know that Gaius helped extend and defend the truth by assisting those who taught and preached it. And he gives another example. In my itinerant ministry, I have stayed in many homes and been encouraged in my work. The host and hostess may not have been especially gifted people, but their ministry of gracious hospitality enabled me to exercise my gifts in the church. Whatever blessings came in the ministry, please pay attention to this last line. Whatever blessings came in the ministry will certainly be credited to their accounts. Okay, let me say this. The most financially savvy people in the world are investors. Once you kind of like, okay, I, I got bread, and I got a roof, and I got clothes. Now what do I do? Well, the initiated or the savvy invest, right? There's a parable about that. It's called the talents. What better way to invest than to invest in someone or some church or some organization that is having genuine, eternal impact? You become a partner in that impact. Like there's this, there's this family in, in Destin um, that were a part of the church that I was a part of for 10 years. And the daughter now is at the age where she's able to go on this mission experience that's like for a year. And she travels the world and stays in different places. And I remember this girl and she was, I mean, 10 years, that seems to go by so fast when you're 39. But... Um, I remember when she wasn't the age that she is now and she was just in grade school and just to be able to see her like excited about Jesus and like saying, hey, I'm trying to raise money for this mission experience. I was like, I don't have any money, but whatever I have, I'm gonna give it to you because that's awesome. And I wanna partner with you in that. So I, like, I'm not saying this, to, I'm not gonna tell you who it was. Or how much, it might've been a penny. That might've been all I gave her. You don't know. Could've been a penny. But at least I gave what I could and I felt like, oh, I did, not like I felt so good about it in the humanitarian experience, but I was like, man, I'm stoked to partner with this person because this person is like legitimate. And this person, I think, is going to do great things. And I want, I want to be a part of that. Um, can I ask you a question? Like, are you the owner or the steward of what God gives you? And are you stewarding it? Are you investing it? where you're going to get the best return on that investment. I got to promise you, man, it's not on this side of eternity. There's this guy named Jesus, and he said this. 
Don't lay up for your treasures on earth where, where moth and rust can destroy. But lay up your treasures in heaven. Here's the deal. There's no moth, no rust there. You can't take what you have with you. But you can take what you have and send it ahead of you. You do that by investing your time, talent, and treasure into eternity. Um, or don't, right? Like pick a side. Invest here or invest there, but don't pretend to invest there and really invest here. Like, like be, be, be legit. Because um, I'll be honest with you. I think, it's just an opinion, I'm not necessarily young. I mean, 39 seems to me like midlife. I don't know if I'll make it to 78. Maybe I will. But like, hopefully that's not pessimistic. Is that pessimistic? I don't know. Whatever. Here's what I'm trying to say, man. I feel like the young can like sniff out like disgenuineness. And I feel like the, um, see they're sniffing over there. I heard them sniffing. Um, I feel like a generation ahead of the another generation, just be genuine. Like, just be one person. Don't be some way privately in a different way publicly. That's, that's so challenging to be two people. Just, just be one person. It's exhausting to try and be two people. I'm this way at church. I'm this way at school. I'm this way on social media. I'm this way. No, just be one person. And just be the same. And if you say, hey, I don't want to invest in the kingdom. Oof, that was nice to get that off my chest. Now maybe I should. You know, like, whatever it is. Like, denial is always the first enemy to kind of, like, break through. Maybe the South should realize that the South sometimes is a place where everyone's a Christian, but no one is. And I don't mean that about you. I mean about those people in Destin, right? No, just teasing. Like, I used to live there. I can say that. Don't, don't ever tell them I said that. It was just a joke. If I was in Destin, I would have said it about you. It's just the way preachers do it. Just a game, just a little thing, you know, not anything real. But it's this reality, right? Like, maybe you, after you, you've lived in the South for maybe a second. Like, sometimes, like, you're a Christian? Okay. Wow. I would have never known. The way you do business doesn't seem to like, maybe, I don't know, it's just crazy. Like, this is my last thing. I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team up and then we're going to close this down. But here's the message title of today. Let's put it up on the screen. The message title today is Let's Get Healthy. Well, how? Like, let's look at the next one. The next one says this. If you're like a healthy spirit, healthy status, and a healthy perspective on stuff, where does that come from? It comes from the right perspective on life and eternity. Where do I get that? Here's how I think you get this, how you balance spiritual health. It's in three ways. Rhythmically come to a worship gathering that's not about you. Sundays. Learn and live the Bible. Sing God's praises. Pray. Serve God's people. When communion's being offered, take it. When baptism is happening, celebrate it. Give your resources to the kingdom. Those 10 values that we went over a few weeks ago, that's what we're doing on a Sunday. We're just doing those 10. In a way, that's a worship gathering. But then you need to do something else. Not only do you need to gather to love Jesus and worship him, but you need to gather to connect with other Christians. I think to, to, to stay spiritually balanced, you need to be in a row and a circle every week. That's, that's possible. Like, don't get weird about it. Be like, okay, Got my religious checklist. You weren't in a row. You weren't in a circle. No. Stop sin sniffing, right? Like, just pay attention to your own walk. Like, like, but rhythmically, you recognize that in the majority of my life, I, I'm in a row and I'm in a circle every week. And then thirdly, daily, I live like a missionary. Because when you became a Christian, you got a new job description. You are now on mission in your world with the good news of Jesus. And here's the danger of a message like this. The danger is doo-doo. That's the danger of this message. The danger of this message, you go, oh no, I'm not healthy in my spirit. I'm not healthy in my status. I'm not healthy in stuff. And I have the wrong perspective on life and eternity. What do I do? The good news is, it's not about you doing it. It's about the one who's done it for you. And like the apostle Paul said, the hope of our glory is Christ in us. The only one who can be a Christian is Christ in you and through you. 
It's about you, Galatians 2.20. That's your powerhouse. Read Galatians 2.20. Read it. It's really good. It's all about you like getting your source from Jesus. That he's the source. He's the one who lives his life through you. You died, Colossians 3.1. It's no longer about you. It's about him and them. It's about we, not me. It's about he, not I. And when you get that right, you'll get this right. doesn't mean that this won't be challenging. In the world, you will have tribulation and challenge and sorrow and pain and loss and death. God bless you. Have a great day. But, like, there's going to be that. But let me just say this last thing. But, but, team, listen, this isn't home. Like, we're headed to home. There is a future for us. There is a kingdom that we'll live in, a country that we'll live in. There won't be elections. Like, there's Jesus. He's the king. And it ain't changing. Thank God. Finally got the right leader I'm looking forward to that day to finally see the face of the voice that I've followed for the last 20 years I cannot wait for that day but for now so much to do so much to do And there are so many people that live in 32561, 32563, 32566, 32541, whatever zip code that don't know Jesus, that don't live for Jesus, that aren't in love with Jesus. They're pursuing salary, status, sex, substance, situation, and stuff. And can I ask you in humility, what are you doing about it? You're called to live on mission right here. And you won't be able to do that in heaven. Love, connect, mission. Love and connect is going to happen way better up there than it is here, man. I love Rob and the team, but they got angels up there that are going to lead in worship. And Rob's angelic. We all love Rob and the team. But, but like, it's going to be phenomenal up there, right? Like, connection. Wouldn't you say sometimes community is hard because people exist and there's sin? It's not going to happen anymore. There's going to be people, but there's not going to be no more sin. Mission? Nope. It's done. It's done. It's done. So don't waste another moment living for salary, status, sex, substance.